Welcome to the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. This is our 91st episode on March 3rd, 2022. My name is Andy Z. I'm the host of the show coming to you this week from Revolution Books in New York City. And I'm in New York because the serious fight for the right of women in this country to have the right to control their own lives, their own reproduction, the right to abortion on demand and without apology hangs in the balance as the Supreme Court of the United States considers whether or not to overturn this fundamental right for half of humanity. Do not sugarcoat what is at stake. Without this right, women, their lives, their future will be enslaved to the state. I am in New York City because a new movement, Rise Up for Abortion Rights, was initiated by the co-host of this show, Sansara Taylor, and others has decided to make New York the flagship for initiating the determined fierce struggle that is urgently needed and that is required to win this fight. This past Sunday, there was one of the most moving speakouts I've ever been to at St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is the heart of the New York Catholic Diocese, that has unleashed over decades its enormous resources to subjugate women as well as LGBTQ people, with a focus and a start on going after and opposing the right to abortion. And this coming week, on International Women's Day, March 8th, New York will be the site of the first march of Rise Up for Abortion Rights. And the majority of our program today will be focused and devoted to this. But first, this. Look familiar? It should. It's not Ukraine. It is what your U.S. government called shock and awe, directed against a sovereign nation, Iraq, in 2003 on the basis of outright lies. Mass deception delivered by Colin Powell at the United Nations on the orders of then-President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney. There is the stench of the foulness of bombs over Ukraine that seeps from your TVs. But there is an equally dangerous ideological poison that comes from the mouths of the media and politicians on both sides of the great divide in the U.S. ruling class and is echoed by all too many progressives. This past Tuesday night on March 1st, the world was treated to the spectacle of the President of the United States in his State of the Union address and most of Congress adorned with their Ukraine pins yellow and blue dresses and scarves and ties chanting USA, USA, USA. <laughs> Biden intoning with all the self-righteousness he could muster. In the battle between democracy and autocracy, democracies are rising to the moment and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security, end quote. In the battle between democracy and autocracies, Democracies are rising to the moment, and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security. Wait a goddamn minute. Democracy? Oh, it's a democracy, all right. A democracy which has invaded, staged coups, subverted elections in almost every year since 1805. In fact, the U.S. has been involved in a war for 225 of its 243 years of existence, with close to 200 of these wars being foreign interventions. Democracy? A democracy which incarcerates the most people in the history of the world. A democracy whose police have taken over the lynching role of the Ku Klux Klan in disproportionately shooting people of color. A democracy which takes place within and covers over the framework of an actual dictatorship that every capitalist imperialist country must exercise around the world and right here in the homeland. USA, USA is objectively a celebration and a rallying cry for all the exploitation and oppression of the capitalist imperialist system and the suppression and repression to enforce this over the masses of people here and around the world. 
the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian begins an extremely relevant article to this moment titled Shameless American Chauvinism, Anti-Authoritarianism as a Cover for Supporting U.S. Imperialism with this. Go search where you may. Roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation. And you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. This by the former slave and the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. In this article, Bob Avakian, speaking to the horrific invasion of Ukraine by Russia, writes, Certainly the big power of bullying and aggression by Russia with its invasion of Ukraine, a clear example, is something that all decent people should oppose. But no decent person should be joining in with U.S. imperialism in their rivalry with Russian imperialism, end quote. And this, joining with U.S. imperialists, whose political representatives were chanting USA, USA, as Biden spoke, is what too many progressive and liberals are caught up in. Five years ago, in a speech on the need to drive the Trump-Pence fascist regime from power, Bob Avakian made this crucial and pithy point on what entraps the minds of even those who do have knowledge of what the U.S. has done and still does around the world. One of the biggest obstacles standing in the way and weighing people down is American chauvinism. The disgusting notion that America and Americans are better and more important than everybody else. This is a poison infecting people broadly in this country, even among the bitterly oppressed. And there is a great need for people to break with this American chauvinism. Free yourself from the GTF the great tautological fallacy. A fallacy, an idea or way of thinking that is false, wrong. A tautology, a round in a circle way of reasoning that asserts something and then claims to prove it by merely asserting the same thing again. So the great tautological fallacy to which I am referring is the notion that America is a force for good in the world. And therefore, whatever it does is good, or at least done with good intentions. Even if the same thing, when done by other forces, especially by forces opposed to us, is bad, is evil, because, because America is a force for good in the world. <laughs> Thus, in the grip of the great tautological fallacy, when one is told by the authorities and government and the media, etc., that North Korea developing a small number of nuclear weapons and a few long-range ballistic missiles poses a grave threat, one does not question. One does not ask why that is a grave threat, while the only country ever to use nuclear weapons, the United States, having thousands of nuclear weapons and the capability to use them anywhere in the world is somehow not a grave threat. In the same article from this past week, Baba Vakin speaks to how this applies to the situation in the Ukraine. For those of us who are not willing to be blinded by this GTF, we can and must confront and analyze reality as it actually is and draw the necessary conclusions. Besides the fact that the U.S. is today and has historically been allied with many authoritarian governments throughout the world, and in fact has forcibly installed such governments in many countries, the even more fundamental fact is that the essence of the conflict between the U.S. and countries like Russia and China is not one between democracy and authoritarianism, but is a matter of rivalry among imperialist powers, all of which are monstrous oppressors of masses of people, and none of which represent or act in the interest of humanity. What is called for, and urgently now, is to oppose all imperialist marauders and mass murderers and all systems and relations of oppression and exploitation, while giving particular emphasis to opposing our own imperialist oppressors who commit their monstrous crimes in our name and seek to rally us to support them on the basis 
of a grotesque American chauvinism, which we must firmly reject and fiercely struggle against. Go to Revcom.us to read this and an accompanying article whose title speaks precisely to that which I am speaking of, again, from the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, B.A. Imperialist Parasitism and Democracy, Why So Many Liberals and Progressives Are Shameless Supporters of Their Imperialism. On Friday night in New York, I will be speaking in person right here at Revolution Books in Harlem and via live stream with Raymond Lada in an emergency forum, War in Ukraine. What is happening? Why is it happening? And where do the interests of humanities lie? And what does it have to do with the revolution humanity so urgently needs? Before moving to the rest of our program, I have to say that Biden's State of the Union was nothing but lies, bribes, and ideological poison. It was a pitiful and contemptible appeal to reach across the aisle to find unity with the fascist Republican Party while perfunctorily running down a laundry list of his programs, the bribes. Two things stand out that are relevant to today's shows. First, in one of his most impassioned moments, he said, quote, we should all agree the answer is not defund the police. The answer is fund the police, end quote. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. Right. It's to fund the police. <laughs> fund them. Fund them. Biden was so pleased with himself and the fascist Republican standing in ovation that he repeated, fund the police, fund the police, fund the police three times. So related to the vicious need to enforce white supremacy and control over the masses of people, our closing segment today will feature a short illustrated piece by B.A. Racism. White kids need to learn about it. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a whole program on this. Then later in Biden's State of the Union, he mentioned that a woman's right to choose in the Roe v. Wade decision that's upcoming should be upheld but he would not utter the word abortion. And he said zero about the fight that needs to be waged to keep this right. So now let's go to our first segment, Rise Up for Abortion Rights. And we're gonna begin with a video excerpts from this speak out in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral this past Sunday, February 27th. Overturn Roe versus Wade. To overturn Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade overturned. Abortion rights are under attack. With the Supreme Court poised to gut or overturn entirely abortion rights nationwide that were established in the landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. A ruling is expected by late spring and a new movement, RiseUpForAbortionRights.org, is determined to bring forward resistance massive enough to defeat this assault on abortion rights. On March 8th, International Women's Day, they will protest and march in New York City, Los Angeles, and nationwide. As part of building momentum for this, they staged a speak out and nonviolent civil disobedience at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City on February 27th. Here are some highlights from that day. So we're here in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral, and we're out here with Rise Up for Abortion Rights. And we're here because we refuse to let the U.S. Supreme Court deny women's humanity and decimate their rights. 33 years ago, I stood here with the New York Pro-Choice Coalition and raised this hanger, this same hanger, and this is a symbol of only one of the things that women used when they didn't have access to legal and safe abortions, you see? And so many women, so many women died. Well, I'm here today to get your attention. I want to get the attention of every woman and girl and every person of conscience in this country because women's rights are in a far more critical state of emergency now, a far more critical state of emergency. I started one of the first abortion clinics, legal abortion clinics in New York in 1971. This was 1971. 
a pioneer and 51 years ago now, right? And abortion was legalized in New York three years before the Supreme Court. So this was in 1971. And I remember my first patient. Her name was Helen and she came from New Jersey. New Jersey, because abortion was still illegal in New Jersey. So in 1971, I saw a patient from New Jersey. Now in 2002, I'm seeing patients for Texas. What's wrong with this picture? I am also, I stand here as a woman who had an abortion when I was 32 years old because I did not want to be a mother at that time. I could have been, I was married, I had all of the supports, but I chose, I chose, I chose not to be a mother. We must take the responsibility out of the closet. Own your lives, own your moral choices. Your body is your country and your dreams are your own. Protect and defend them. If not you, if not me, then who? Who? And if not now, when? Roe did more than establish woman's right to abortion. It solidified and expanded the constitutional right to privacy. Included in that is right to contraception, procreation, marriage, family, family relations, child rearing, and intimacy, meaning sex. Any challenges to Roe threaten the protections for these most fundamental rights. In 1962, I was a young actor in New York studying in Lee Strasberg's professional classes. And I lived in a building in a sixth floor walk up, and I still live in a sixth floor walk up, a different one, on West 10th Street. And on the third floor was this very exotic woman. She was a cabaret performer. She had jet black hair, and I used to go hear her at the Blue Angel on 8th Street. One morning she called me at 6.30 and she said, Jim, would you come down here right now? I went down. She still had an apartment with a bathtub in the kitchen. You have to be old enough like me to understand those days. I looked at her and it was full of red water. She said, you must go to the, the drugstore and get me maximum strength Kotex. Now, you have to understand what that meant to this young gay man. I was embarrassed. I had, those were women's things over there. But I did it. And I came back. And she was dead. Dead! Because she had had a botched abortion over in what was the meat market at that time. And she had no choice. No choice. And from that moment on, I understood more today than then that the very same institutions, the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, etc., all the religious fanatics that, that want to think they can control me, can control my, my choices about my body, made me affected by what had happened to her. As a black woman and a single mother too, abortion without apology enabled me to send two girls to college. We need to be able to make our own choices. We are not incubators. I'm gonna repeat, we are not incubators. Rise up for abortion rights. When I saw the statement from Rise Up for Abortion Rights. I signed it and donated $50, which I couldn't afford to do, but I did it. I am asking you to donate today. I had an, Ill an illegal abortion in 1969. My friend found an old GP in a nearby town. I was lucky that he didn't demand any sexual favors or extra money. He did his thing with a cigarette hanging off of his, between his lips and the ash kept getting longer 
and longer. I focused on it because I thought the ash was going to fall into my vagina. When I returned home a week later, I was reading the morning paper, and there was my abortionist on page three, charged with murder. He perforated a woman's uterus while helping, uterus while helping her. That could have been me. That could have been me. No one should have to go through that or worse die for lack of a safe abortion care. Growing up in the Catholic Church, I was taught to think that abortion was a bad thing. I would see the images of the, the babies, right? Quote unquote, the fetuses. And in all that, the women were erased of that whole situation. And I was trained to think that women just had to, they had to be mothers. And my best friend came to me when I was 16 years old in an abusive relationship and said to me, help me get an abortion. And I said no. And I didn't even think about what it was like for her to be living in a situation where she had to go back to an abusive partner and give birth to yet another child that she did not want. When I changed my ways of thinking and understood what an abortion actually is and understood that without this basic right, women are reduced to nothing more than breeders of children. And their life and what they're going through just gets completely erased out of the situation. Uh, we have a very special guest. She's flown here from San Antonio to testify about being denied an abortion after a br brutal gang rape when she was a teenager. I went to the, to the, the office with the nurse, I challenged, what happened to me? The, 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 that guys from the school raped me. I need help because I can't have a child. They say, no, the, the babies have protection. You don't have rights. So I don't say my parents. I go to the street. I go with my baby. I was in the street. I said, where are? The people who make the laws, where are they? I want to hear, to help me, to lend me my rights, to lend me my shoes. But no, they are machistas. When I, when I saw my kid grow up and watching me and telling me, mom, who is my dad, you know, I and that is stupid laws, and that's a stupid men who made the law. So how I said, my son, you are from different men. I don't know who is your daddy because I was raped. You know, and now, now I, I want to cry hard, 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 because I am very angry, because the law don't protect really the women. I am, I have rights. I decide in my body. I decide if I, if I have that child. I decide if I am in conditions to have that kid. This fascist program of control over women relies on us cowering in the silence that they heap on us. And today, at this moment when Roe v. Wade, the right to abortion nationwide, hangs in the balance, we have to say the truth here. This silence is being aided and abetted by the so-called leaders of the so-called women's movement, who are telling you that you can do nothing but roll over and accept the obliteration of Roe v. Wade. Whatever they call this, however they dress it up, this is capitulation. And the fact that this so-called women's movement and the people of this country did not flood the streets in fury, did not shut down every freeway, did not walk out of every school, did not bring this society to a halt when the state took away the right to abortion to six million women of childbearing age in Texas last September. This is shameful. This is shameful. And this stops now. This stops today. Because when we rise, 
when we dare, when we back it up with our bodies on the line and the God's honest truth, then we are right. Right is on our side and they are wrong and the shame belongs on them. When we put it on the line, we can summon a force and call for a force that is a match for these fascist women haters. That is a match for these dark ages shame throwers. That is a match for these pompous patriarchal politicians who have no right to tell a woman what to do with her body and her life. This fury, this unbridled, unrestrained fury of millions and millions of women rising up and rebelling against thousands and thousands of years of tradition's chains. This fury is a force that can shake the whole society and it can change the whole world. And that is what we aim to do. Yes, this is going to take a fight. And yes, it is going to take sacrifice. And yes, at times it's gonna be scary. But I say look at the women of Colombia. They won the decriminalization of abortion in a Catholic country, in a patriarchal repressive state. They won it what tipped the tide is when they looked at the women of Argentina who are raising this green bandana and filling the streets with their fury relentlessly, courageously, in the face of sacrifice, and they won the right to abortion. In the streets, March 8th, we will puncture the silence, we will wake up millions more, and then we will go to work together to do the hard but necessary and inspiring work to spark and spread and organize tens of thousands more and ultimately millions in a movement massive enough, righteous enough, defiant and relentless enough that we sweep across this country and make clear to the fascists on the Supreme Court and women haters everywhere that if they try to take this right away, their society will be prevented from functioning it at all. What we just watched was a video from the protests of Rise Up for Abortion Rights this past Sunday, February 27th, in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. And I'm here in New York City at Revolution Books, but I'm on Zoom with Sansara Taylor on the other side of town. Welcome, Sansara, to the Revolution Nothing Less show. Andy, it's great to be with you. Welcome to New York. I just have to say that um, protest this weekend, the testimonies were were so moving. Uh, you know, I'd heard of some of these before, but I, my eyes were watery and I just was, was just so moved by it all. And, and then when the exuberance of people taking to the streets, having heard this, uh, indicated to me a tremendous amount of potential. But we, let's get to what we want to talk about because we're just, uh, we're less than a week out or, uh, from the uh, March 8th International Women's Day protest for abortion rights. So, Sansara, the statement for Rise Up for Abortion Rights uh, that's on their website, on your website, uh, says, if we leave this to Congress, the courts, and state legislators, and do not fill the streets with people determined to stop this, then there is virtually no hope for stopping this assault. But if we in our multitudes stand up in an uncompromising defiance, then there is a possibility not a certainty, but a real possibility that we could beat back this assault and begin to change the whole political dynamic in this country. Our only way forward and our best way forward is to resist, to step outside the confines of official politics and fill the streets with our fury." End quotes. And sorry, the whole statement is very important. But look, that conveys an approach to this. But what is the vision? What is the necessary form of struggle that has to be waged to stop this attack on this fundamental right to abortion that Rise Up for Abortion Rights is calling for? Well, I think one of the things that you saw in the video that we just watched that I spoke to on Sunday was the example that was set down in Argentina and taken up in Colombia and a similar approach was taken in Mexico where people went into the streets really in mass 
in relentless ways, again and again, filled the streets, organized, organized on the campuses, really created a situation where everybody had to pick a side. I mean, we've taken up the green bandana but, uh, modeled down in Argentina and taken up in Colombia. But I remember hearing stories from students who said, uh, everybody was wearing a bandana. You're blue for anti-abortion or green for, for abortion rights. And everybody had to pick a side. It forced the question in front of society because people stood up and acted in the streets and then in every realm. And I think here in this country, there are millions and millions of people who have a deep, deep vested interest in protecting the right to abortion and going forward to expand the, the rights of women overall and fight for the liberation of women. But this right now is a, a social force of millions that is sitting back doing very little. And so this is what we have to galvanize and change first on International Women's Day. I mean, we kicked it off last sat Sunday, but manifesting on International Women's Day and putting a challenge to everybody else in society to get out in the streets and join us and show where you stand and pick a side. Because right now, to sit back and do nothing when the Supreme Court is on track to eviscerate abortion rights and clinics across this country are under siege and anti-abortion legislation is being passed in states across the country, to sit back and do nothing is to facilitate this enslavement of women that is forced motherhood. So, well, look, to achieve that, what needs to actually happen on March 8th on International Women's Day? And what do the viewers of this show and everybody they know need to do between now and March 8th to make a real beginning, to really get that vision that you're talking about in motion. Well, I wanna, I wanna start by making very clear yet again, March 8th needs to be a powerful, powerful manifestation. And everybody has to pull out all the stops to get people there. Everybody you know, everybody you don't know and you can reach, there, and there are many concrete ways to do it and many creative ways hopefully people will come up with off of watching this and working with each other. But one way is this green bandana that I mentioned. Wear it, take it everywhere, make a lot of them, tell people what it means. It's standing up for abortion rights from Argentina to Colombia and right here. Make it a symbol and spread that example and let them know it's connected to manifesting on March 8th, where to be in your city. Um, in New York, it's 3 p.m. at Union Square. Also, you put go to a campus, go to a high school, take stickers. We have them at the riseupforabortionrights.org website. You can download flyers, print them off, hand them out. Get a pair of white pants and put bloody paint at the crotch and do a die-in. Make the students step over you. Wake them up to what's happening and what the future has in store. Go in front of hospitals where there are medical professionals and reach out to them. You have to take this Sunday morning at the, at the progressive churches. We should be all over the place, inviting people and challenging them to show up now so that they're not having services later for women whose lives are lost or foreclosed. This is an emergency moment and there's a lot of ways in. And we have really great materials, a fact sheet, flyers at riseupforabortionrights.org. There's uh, social media graphics and videos that are up on the, on the uh, on the uh, social media feeds of the different platforms, but you also can make your own, make your video saying why you're doing this. And I, I know in Los Angeles, some of the young people, there's a lot of creative forms. They've taken uh, coat hangers, wire coat hangers, which were an instrument that many women used before abortion was legal to induce their own abortions. They would untwist the coat hanger and, and, and shove it up their vaginas and try to induce an abortion and often perforate their uteruses and die. So they've taken these wire coat hangers and put flyers on them and they're hanging them all over the city. And it makes people ask the question, what is this? What does it mean? Gets people talking. There's a lot of creative ways, but people really need to bear down in these final days and, and wake people up and let everything be connected to March 8th, time and place where you have to be to manifest. So, Sarah, this is International Women's Day, and the front line of the struggle for the liberation of women, uh, which is half of humanity, and so that women aren't enslaved, as you have well put out, eloquently spoken of, uh, is an integral to emancipating all of humanity. Um, I want to just play something from one of the Revcoms from the book Basics from the Talks and Writings of Bob Avakian. This is Basics 322. It's the third chapter, the 22nd quote read by a member of the Revolution Club. You cannot break all the chains except one. 
You cannot say you want to be free of exploitation and oppression, except you want to keep the oppression of women by men. You can't say you want to liberate humanity, yet keep one half of the people enslaved to the other half. The oppression of women is completely bound up with the division of society into masters and slaves, exploiters and exploited. And the ending of all such conditions is impossible without the complete liberation of women. All this is why women have a tremendous role to play, not only in making revolution, but in making sure there's all the way revolution. The fury of women can and must be fully unleashed as a mighty force for proletarian revolution. Baba Vakian, Basics 322. So Sansara, it's a simple question. What do you got to say about that in terms of what actually is going to be the importance of International Women's Day and the importance of being out in the street and what that has to do with everything that's concentrated in that quotation? Well, I think, to be clear, everybody who wants to stand up for abortion rights needs to be there at these protests on March 8th. But speaking as part of that broader movement, those of us who understand the need for an actual revolution, those of us who are revcoms and followers of BA, that quote is so at the heart of what the revolution that BA is fighting for and has re-envisioned really is about. And it's, to me, there's a double challenge in that quote. First of all, there's a challenge to everybody who hates oppression, who hates injustice, who wants to stand up against the injustices they see in this world, that you cannot say you're against them and sit aside from the struggle to break the chains that bind women. And right now to sit aside from the fascist assault and the juggernaut of female enslavement that is headed towards the lives of women and girls in this country and around the world. So that's the challenge on the one side. Everybody should take up the fight to break the chains on women and all oppression based on gender and sexual exploitation and oppression. But the challenge on the other side, and this is a challenge I think also needs to get out, is to everybody who is sick of the way that women have for millennia been beaten, degraded, harassed, raped, assaulted, dismissed, silenced, shackled, shrouded, sold right now by the millions in the international sex slave trade. Everybody who wants to see an end to the way that women are disrespected and discounted and treated as less than human, including this current juggernaut against women's fundamental right to abortion and to control their lives and their bodies, needs to get serious about the system that is at the root of this oppression, capitalism, imperialism in the world today, and that we can only fully break these chains. Yes, we should unleash the fury of women against all forms of oppression right now, furiously and mightily, but to really get to a place where all these chains are broken, we need a revolution that brings this system down and replaces it with a far better system in society. And this is what Baba Vakian has also envisioned. This is the revolution that is possible in the era that we are living in right now and waging this fight to defeat this fascist assault on abortion rights and to get out there on International Women's Day, March 8th in New York City, Los Angeles, around the country is part of defeating that assault, but also can be part of prying open and bringing closer the kind of revolution that is needed to emancipate women and emancipate all of humanity. Okay, so with that, Sansara, um, I'm looking forward to Tuesday, March 8th, and to seeing you, well, I'll probably see you before then, but to certainly seeing you then. So, uh, good to have you uh, on the RNL show. You are the co-host of the show, and um, let's, let's really pull out all the stops, uh, not just ourselves, but everybody who's watching this show. This is a time, there's not another time for you to step forward. This is a time to step forward. Because if we manifest in the way that Sansara is calling for, now it can inspire people to do the kind of, and to wage the kind of struggle that she's so well described that is going to be essential to beat back this assault on the fundamental uh, lives and uh, rights of women here with impact around the world. So we'll see you soon, Sansara. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Andy. In light of the responses, to laws being passed across the country over whether or not 
the teaching of the actual history of this country, in particular the history of racist oppression, will be allowed to be taught to a generation of youth. We have produced a short video of Bob Avakian's recent article called Racism, Why Kids Need to Learn About It. Racism, White Kids Need to Learn About It. Allow teachers to teach the truth. A dozen Republican-led states seeking to ban or limit how the role of slavery and the pervasive effects of racism can be taught. We're teaching people that our country is a horrible place, it's a racist place. We have reached the book-burning stage. We are eradicating uh, this bad stuff. Burn them. Today, fascist politicians, parent groups, and other fascist lunatics are waging a vicious campaign to ban books and in other ways keep kids and people generally from learning even some of the basic truth about this country, its actual history, and its present reality. One of the main lines of attack of these fascists is the claim that learning about white supremacy and racism will make children, that is, white children feel bad. We can and should teach this history without labeling a young child as an oppressor or requiring he or she feel guilt or shame. Well, as a white youth growing up in the 1950s and early 1960s, when I learned about white supremacy and racism, it did make me feel bad. And that was a very good thing. It made me feel outraged. And yes, it made me feel ashamed. And that made me want to do something to be part of fighting against this white supremacy and racism. And I was not alone in this. This was the experience of huge numbers, millions of white youth who came of age in that period, who were inspired by the civil rights movement and then by the more militant black liberation movement and became part of the revolutionary upsurge of the 1960s. These fascists are determined not to let something like that happen again in these highly charged times. Poisoning the minds of our youth at school, turning some of them into revolutionaries in the streets. And instead, they are setting out to mold a bunch of mindless white youth into rabid racists, similar to the Hitler youth in Germany during the rise of the Nazi fascists there in the 1930s. Shutting down these fascists in their attempts to suppress the truth about this country is a crucial part of defeating this fascism overall. And this, in turn, can be and must be part of getting rid of this whole system of capitalism imperialism, which has bred this fascism, which has white supremacy built into its foundation and its ongoing functioning which is the source of horrific oppression of literally billions of people here and throughout the world, and is a threat to the very existence of humanity through its escalating destruction of the environment and the continual danger of war between nuclear-armed capitalist imperialist powers, including the U.S., Russia, and China. So this brings us to the end of today's show. I want to come back to International Women's Day and the importance of everybody watching the show to go all out over the next days to organize for March 8th, to, to get out there for abortion on demand and without apology. If you're anywhere new, near New York, within 500 miles, get here on Tuesday night and be part of this march. We have to show the world that we are going to stand up and not take this. Um, but International Women's Day, as uh, I discussed with Sansara, is about more than just 
the right to abortion. It's about the liberation of women and the role of the liberation of women in the emancipation of all humanity. And I want to close today's show with the song by the revolutionary band Outer National titled Free Women. Uh, the uh, author of the song, uh, the, the songwriter, Miles Soleil, wrote this, which you can read in full on the YouTube page. In every part of the world, literally every country, women are degraded, subjugated, and objectified as less than fully human beings. I originally wrote this song in memory of the disappeared woman of the border city of Juarez, Mexico, where countless women and girls had been raped, mutilated, and murdered. So with that, I look forward to seeing you in New York City this coming Friday at Revolution Books and on Tuesday, March 8th at the International Women's Day March. And then I'll see all of you next Thursday night on this same Revolution Nothing Less show, episode number 92. One way or another, I'm going to find you. I'm trying to. Sky